Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to some. Uh, my name is Arko Kwach, and I am a program officer at the National Committee on US-China Relations. It is an honor to welcome everybody here to the second program in our Chinatown Hall series with today's focus on society and culture. Thank you all for taking the time to join us for today's important conversation with all of our panelists. They are dedicated and committed to charting a path forward in this area of the relationship. Uh, without further ado, I am delighted to introduce our moderator, Allison Friedman. Allison is the Artistic Director of Performing Arts at the West Kowloon Cultural District Authority in Hong Kong. She is also a member of the National Committee's Public Intellectuals Program. Allison, over to you. Thank you so much, Erica, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, about this incredible topic that is dear to my heart. I've lived in China and greater China for nearly 20 years working at the crossroads of arts and culture and how that can bring people together to across differences, across disagreements to see what we have in common. And I'm heartened by more than 400 people who registered for today's, uh, this, today's topic. Clearly it resonates and is now more than ever as important. I will briefly introduce our three panelists. Uh, you have their extended bios, so I won't go in depth. And then I'll invite each of them to share a specific story of how the work they are currently doing, have been doing, has really started to build these bridges. Very often when we talk about cultural exchange, uh, we talk in generalities. And I think we need to look at the very specific and the very micro in order to look at the macro impact that we're all having. So today I'm thrilled and honored to invite Raymond Chang. He's the baseball operations manager for Major League Baseball China, responsible for overseeing MLB China development centers and much, much more. We're also, welcome Raymond. Thank you. I'm, I'm also thrilled to welcome Chef Lucas Sin, Eater Young Guns class of 2019 and Forbes 30 under 30. Uh, Lucas opened his first restaurant when he was 16 in an abandoned newspaper factory in his hometown of Hong Kong and ran a diner out of his dorm room in Yale, at Yale. He's now expanded far beyond that and, uh, and we'll be talking more about his uh, Junza kitchen and many other COVID uh, era activities that he's doing to feed New York and beyond. Welcome Lucas. And finally, Janet Yang, president of Janet Yang Productions, a Golden Globe and Emmy award-winning Hollywood producer with deep roots in China, including long partnerships with Oliver Stone, Steven Spielberg, and much, much more. Uh, and so welcome, Janet. Hello, thank you. So as I said, you know, here we have crossing film, food, and baseball. And I think one of the things that the three activities have in common is it's about bringing people together to have shared experiences. And uh, I would like to now invite each of you to share a specific story about how the work that you do is bridging these cultures and bridging uh, China and the US specifically, but perhaps even beyond. So let's start with Lucas. Uh, I'm sitting here in morning in Hong Kong. It's breakfast, I have food on the brain. So Lucas. Hi everybody, um, I'm Lucas. Uh, I'm the chef of Jensen Kitchen and um, to keep it short, Chinsa Kitchen is a, it's a series of fast casual restaurants with this sort of like broad goal of introducing a more complicated and interesting and colorful idea of Chinese food to people in the US starting in New Haven, Connecticut and New York. Um, but beyond this sort of fast casual space, um, I've always been very interested in how Chinese cuisine has continued to evolve and how people have gotten to know Chinese cuisine throughout the years. Um, I'll take you back to a dinner we did recently where we recreated this iconic 1972 dinner um, that was served uh, in the uh, People's Great Hall um, for Richard Nixon when he visited uh, China in 1972. And when we were recre recreating this dinner, we found sort of like interesting things about what gastro diplomacy and what food uh, and uh, as a vessel for introducing culture meant. So, for those of you who are history buffs, um, those of you who know this period of history, you might know that a lot of the tensions within uh, CCP were uh, sort of brought to life in a dinner like this, right? Here is the American president coming to uh, China for the first time. And uh, the, 
type of food that we're putting down, that they were putting down the table and the type of meal that they had constructed for Richard Nixon said very many things about what Chinese cuisine was and how it would be introduced to Americans up to that point. Now there was Chinese food in the US in 1972. There were chop suey houses where jazz musicians and women were allowed to hang out. Um, there was uh, there was a boom, the massive um, uh, Mandarin, one of the most interesting fine dining Chinese restaurants ever to have opened um, in the US were all there. But here is all of the United States waking up in the morning and watching the president eat Peking duck with a pair of chopsticks, um, sharing plates with um, Joe and I. And that in 1972, very much was how this idea for Chinese cuisine was pushed to Americans, right? Um, what I'm interested in now is that the way people have gotten to know more about Chinese cuisine isn't through the telly, it isn't through um, presidents eating fancy banquet meals. Um, it's actually through dumpling shops in Flushing, Queens. Um, it's through pop-up dinners that are now held by uh, Chinese chefs who used to work in French kitchens. Uh, it's held in your East Village noodle shop, um, in, in your San Gabriel Valley's new mom and pop noodle shops. And uh, it's all a very different sort of fabric and different way of introducing what a diverse understanding of Chinese cuisine needs to be. Um, so, so moving forward, I think that's all to say that the future of Chinese cuisine, especially outside of China, must be a colorful and diverse one. Uh, it must include not only the regional Chinese cuisines, you know, Sichuanese cuisine versus Shanghainese cuisine versus Cantonese cuisine or whatnot, but it should also include all the other cultures that Chinese cuisine touches. Uh, I'm particularly interested in Dominican Chinese cooking and Puerto Rican Chinese cooking in Washington Heights. Uh, I'm interested in Chinese food in Japan. I'm also interested in American Chinese food and how that has continued to evolve. But that's just to touch on some of the ideas for how Chinese cuisine has sort of like evolved in the American eye since 1972. Thank you, Lucas. I think what's really interesting about your point about Dominican cuisine and Japanese cuisine, uh, Chinese cuisine in Japan and this, this expanding concept of what is Chinese food is really about, um, I like to say the battle of and versus or. So often people think, well, Chinese food is just this and American food is just this. And there are these binaries or these very rigid categories. And what you kind of encapsulated in a nutshell with your story is that it's so much more than that. It can be the and. And I think that this is also one of the crucial things that society and cultural exchanges like what we're talking about today can help bring to the national dialogues is this concept of and. It's not just about one thing. It's about all of these diversity of representations that we can see. So great, we'll come back to that. I have a lot more questions for you. Janet, moving over to you, speaking of representation and, and, and diversity of, uh, of representation, please share with us your story of what you're working on. Thank you, Allison. I've always known that representation on screen, whether it be the large screen or the small screen has deep implications and deep psychological impact. I grew up not seeing people that looked my, like myself and it wasn't until I went to live in China in the early eighties after I graduated from college where I became so excited about the possibilities of not just myself but others from the West seeing people playing the good, the bad, the ugly, all Chinese in front of in the camera, also the artistic talent that was flourishing. So that's really what launched my excitement about being in the movie business. I was bringing Chinese films over and American films over. And then inevitably, after I had the chance to work with Steven Spielberg on the movie Empire of the Sun, I thought, oh, so this is what a producer does. We create the words and the images that people see all over the world. And for so long that has been dominated by America. So it's really been my mission for decades now to find ways to bring humanized versions of Chinese Asians in general or any underrepresented people to the screen. And they've come in many, many forms. I, I, you know, part of Joy Luck Club was shot there. I made an indie movie called Dark Matter with where Meryl Streep played a, a secondary character to the very well-known uh, star in China named Liu Ye. I did a version of a high school musical for Disney. I made another film called Shanghai Calling, but this most recent um, 
adventure that I had is is very very telling and and what I like about it is that it's an animated movie and it seems to transcend a lot of political historical biases. The movie I'm speaking of is Over the Moon, which is on Netflix right now. And it was five years ago where I was invited to a brain summit uh, or brain trust, I think they called it by then Oriental DreamWorks Animation. So there was a time not that long ago, very recently when virtually every studio was trying to do business with China, whether to do co-productions, whether to release their films there. There was a, a, just a flurry of activity, a lot of courtship between the two sides. And the results of one of, one of these courtships was, was uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg creating Oriental DreamWorks Animation with, with Li Reigang, who's a very well-known person in China. And so their whole goal was to find Chinese type stories that could then be uh, appealing to uh, an international market. And there was nothing more delicious than, than giving me that mandate. So I came up with the idea of making a film about a girl who wants to see the moon goddess. Everyone in China knows about the moon goddess. And, and one of the things that makes it very interesting to explore Chinese stories is that there's a real uniformity to the education. So if you talk about certain characters from mythology or legends, everybody knows. So I knew Chang'e, is someone that is celebrated each year with mooncakes. She's up, been up there with her bunny rabbit on the moon for thousands of years. We honor her, we honor love on, at the Mid-Autumn Festival. But I wanted it to be a contemporary story to make it more relatable. So I thought, how about a girl who builds a rocket to the moon because we know that girls are as least as smart as boys when it comes to STEM and science and maths and things like that. So that was the idea of a movie that became very appealing. I also gave her a younger brother. She had her own bunny rabbit. So, you know, we started fleshing out the story, we hired a screenwriter, found the, the best possible director. And here it is five years later. And, and one never knows. The world of a, of a producer is highly, highly um, unpredictable, let's put it that way. As somebody once said, it's a terrible job, but a great life because no two days are different. You just never know. So we go along the process and and what we're able to do, because Oriental DreamWorks Animation was based in Shanghai, it became Pearl Studios when it was spun off from the rest of DreamWorks. But there were a group of people that were in, in Shanghai at the time. And so we were able to really tap into a lot of Chinese talent, whether it be animators, whether it be the, the very famous costume designer, Guo Pei, whether it be you know uh, just people who were very knowledgeable, people who knew about Chinese cuisine and about mooncakes. And so it's so rooted in, in, chi in authentic Chinese traditions and culture. And somehow as it is being displayed in an animated movie, which fortunately has, has proven to sell itself to be extremely appealing, it, it lifts it out of something that feels like people can attack it for one reason or another. It is fantasy, but, but the girl character, the 12 year old character, Fei Fei uh, is very appealing. And we've managed to make the world fall in love with a 12 year old Chinese girl. She's living in China. She's living in a beautiful water town, Wuzhen, and she pedals around town delivering mooncakes. You can't not love her. And she has a bunny rabbit. <laughs> And she manages to build a rocket ship to the moon. So, so being able to find these characters again that transcend history or politics or anything too literal, at the same time maintaining authenticity of the culture has been really uh, an, an amazingly gratifying experience, especially at this moment in time, five years later from when I first pitched the story where the world has changed. And there is much more unfriendliness to China than there is friendliness from many, many corners. And I feel that the only way to cut through that is to create very lovable, accessible characters. So I'm hoping that in this way, this movie has, has done its part. Thank you, Janet. That's an incredibly powerful story about how creative works, art, works of art and culture can affect us at an emotional level and change hearts and minds. And we also know that behind the scenes, it is not easy. And I think we'll come back. I have many questions about how to make that happen in a structure and in a, in a working system where perhaps the two systems don't necessarily all work in the same way. So we'll, we'll I'll circle back to ask some of that. But first, I'd like to hear from Raymond 
and your story, uh, I'm sure quite similar to the other two in the baseball sphere, you've been spending a lot of time searching for that next MLB star in China. So over to you. Yeah, thank you, Allison. And thank you everyone for having me. And it's really cool to see so many people on here. It's really neat. So, um, so my story, um, so about four years ago when I first took this job, when I first arrived in China, um, you know, of course I got to meet all my staff over there with Major League Baseball, all my players. We've got a total of about 130 of them right now currently. And, you know, once, um, you know, for the first couple of weeks when I first started to get to know my players, you know, they really had, you know, no idea about, you know, major, you know, MLB baseball, the American culture, American baseball and how everything works. And, you know, it was, it, it was, it wasn't frustrating. It was, it was more kind of like disappointing, you know, cause you know, cause our goal, our mission is to get, you know, these kids an opportunity just like we did when we were young, um, you know, that baseball provided us. And so, uh, one thing that I did the following year is I invited uh, 15 of my players, uh, uh, 13, 14 year old players uh, to Kansas City, which is my hometown and um, had them stay at my house. So as you could imagine, it was a, it was a packed house, uh, went to Ikea, bought a bunch of bunk beds and you know, had everybody stay upstairs and you know, my three rooms up, 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 upstairs in my house. So um, I've got a, before I took the job, I ended up opening up a, a baseball facility, indoor baseball facility in Kansas City. So, you know, I was like, wow, what a perfect combination. You know, I could, you know, ha take them to my baseball facility and, and train them. And then, you know, after training, we can take them out, show them, you know, the Kansas City live, take them to some barbecue, you know, take them to a Kansas City Royals game. You know, just mainly the objective was to show them, um, you know, what American baseball is all about and what kind of opportunities and what kind of you know, environment, um, you know, you guys can have, you know, coming over here. So anyway, so they spent about a month over in Kansas City, over in my house, and they had a, such a great time. I had a great time. Um, they learned a lot. I had a bunch of, you know, special guest coaches come and help train them. And then uh, fast forward four years later, um, out of the 15 that came over, uh, five of them are currently, uh, actually, I'm sorry, four of them are currently uh, in the U.S. Uh, attending college, playing baseball, and one is um, in the U.K. Uh, not playing baseball, but going to college. So, um, you know, whenever they, after the trip to Kansas City, you know, whenever we went back the following year, you know, I, I noticed a difference in them. I noticed, um, you know, uh, a little bit more motivation, dedication to the game, you know, wanting to you know, learn more about the game, watching more Major League Baseball games, doing more research online. And, um, you know, and then they, they knew what it took to uh, survive over here. You know, they had to brush up on their English. You know, they had to study. Um, and then, of course, they had to improve their baseball skills because they, you know, they, they saw what, you know, American 13, 14, 15-year-old baseball players were all about. And they, so they, they knew where they had to go. So it was kind of cool. Um, you know, four years later to kind of see where they are now and that, you know, that I, that I had made a, a little bit of an impact and kind of, you know, opened up their eyes and, and showed, showed them the world a little bit and they're, you know, having success and, and doing with love and, you know, also getting a great education out of it. So, um, but, you know, that's kind of in a nutshell what we're all about, um, you know, and what we do, our mission at Major League Baseball China, we go out, we recruit you know, 12, 11, 12 year old kids, and we get them for six years. And hopefully we get them an opportunity to come over to the States, whether that's for college or, or, or for professional baseball. And, you know, like I said, you know, give them what baseball gave us when we grew up and, you know, the opportunities. So, yeah. Thank you, Ray. You know, I think your story about the kids who are impacted and certainly the fans that are, are growing on in China for baseball um, and back to Janet, your, your, the audiences and the artists that get to experience these things, those are the more visible um, impact of cultural diplomacy, but a lot has to happen behind the scenes in order to, to get the results of the game, of the film, of the performance. So I want to hear, and we'll start with Ray, 
setting up these centers in China is an act of, of cultural exchange and diplomacy in and of itself, because we're bringing over a massive American institution like MLB and the way it works and trying to interface and work with sports institutions, government institutions, business institutions in China that have a different cultural um, way of working. So how were you, what was your role of bridging that divide in getting two different behind the scenes functional institutions to work together? Yeah, it was, it was, it was tough, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll share another kind of quick personal story that kind of goes along to answering your question. Um, you know, the, there's this, there's these international games called the world baseball classic. Maybe some of you guys have heard of it, but it's kind of like the Olympics of baseball and baseball has been kind of in and out of the Olympics recently. And hopefully it'll, it'll climb back in uh, soon. But um, so, you know, all, you know, baseball playing countries really look forward to these games. And I was fortunate enough to, to play in my first one in 2009. And it was really neat because my, my family got an opportunity to come visit and, and, and come watch me play. And, they're both from China. And so it was really kind of neat that, you know, I'm representing their home country. So that, that was the, the cool part for me. Um, but, you know, it was just to kind of show um, that, you know, I'm not just some, you know, American baseball player coming over here and, you know, showing everyone, hey, this is how it's done. And, you know, you got to do it this way. You got to do it that way. You know, I, I you know, um, you know, personally really wanted to, my goal, my mission was to, you know, help out um, the players on the team, get to know all the coaches, get to know all the, the baseball officials, the government officials that were involved, um, you know, with these games, with this team, and, and, and help out in any way that I can. Um, and so now to this day, uh, we're kind of doing the same thing. We're working kind of hand in hand with the Chinese Baseball Association and trying to get them, uh, help them, you know, build the game popularize it, uh, get their players, get the national team more opportunities to come over to the States and just providing them with more resources, you know, just so we can help them continue to, to grow the game. And over the last, you know, six or seven years, I mean, the game of baseball in China has really grown. I mean, not at the rate that, you know, you know, the average fan maybe might think, but, you know, it, it you know, we're starting to get youth baseball all across, you know, the country. And that's where it all starts, the grassroots, you know, getting the, the six, seven, eight-year-old kids to start playing and get them to play early. I mean, that's when I started. I started when I was four or five. And when I first got over there in China, you know, I was recruiting kids and they, you know, at ages of 12, 11 and 12, and they just started the previous year. And they're just so far behind. So we are working hand in hand with the Chinese Baseball Association, uh, with local governments to help put established baseball into the schools, into the elementary schools, get programs all across China to pop up and, you know, just get people, get to get, to get kids, you know, put on a glove and a, and a, and a, and a bat or, and have a bat in their hands and play the game, you know, and that's what it's all about. So. Thank you, Raymond. Mm -hmm. Janet, over to you for the same question. Hong Kong, uh, Hollywood and China have been in the hot seat for a long time about how to make these massive institutions often with very different agendas work together. Uh, and you've been involved from very early days all the way back to Empire of the Sun to your more recent projects. What are some of the ways in these often contentious uh, working relationships have you navigated in order to, to bring incredible creations to our artists and audiences? I think to echo a little bit what Raymond said, it's really important to be a friend first. And fortunately, when I first started going back and forth to China, it was to bring Chinese cinema over to highlight the talent. And I had no other agenda other than I just wanted people to see these films and I wanted them to discover the talent and understand China better and humanize Chinese. So that put me in good stead for any future uh, interactions because there, back in the early 80s, there was no money to be made. <laughs> there was, it was purely cultural exchange. And so I think it's, it's nice to start that way. And then I was as representing studios, bringing American films over. And, and for instance, I accompanied Gregory Peck to show Roman Holiday. So they remember that as also a, a, a really turning point for again ex cultural exchange and and their discovery of american cinema and then as i started working and, and and i understood better i think they you know i was able to accompany steven spielberg so they saw these as positive things and 
it was it's always been nice and to this day i hope that <laughs> their impression of me is that i'm not like so many other people who have rushed in in the last few decades because they they saw dollar signs you know they're so green because the market has exploded and yes my original boss at, at the studios saw that the market was going to open but that wasn't my original intention and you know, being Chinese American has its pros and cons. I like to think it's it, there's more positives than negatives. Uh, we speak the language, we can blend in more easily. We th there's just not the same distance, and so that often helps. And I think also bringing a level of professionalism. I think there's a there there there's a real respect for Chinese Americans who have achieved something in 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 America or outside of China and to create that bridge. So there's always been an eagerness, I think, on their part to work with people like us. And yeah, I, I have found my experiences there to be uniformly positive. There have been a lot of other experiences <laughs> that other people have relayed, which aren't necessarily that. And I feel like I have a little bit of an insight into where things fell apart, because I am truly straddling. I don't take one side or another. It's never a black and white situation. So I, in that way, I think uh, I've been able to be helpful in, in certain situations. And I've just found it to be fun. You have to enjoy it. It's not for the faint of heart. There's a certain, I, I have told friends of mine who work in and around China a lot that it's a special breed of person that is able to roll with the punches. If you're a control freak, forget it. If you, if you feel that there's definitely you know a right specific way of doing things and you want to teach other people how to do it, that is you know Chinese not going to be a good environment for you. I think if you have a level of flexibility, and willingness to to learn, and be 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 very adaptable and really try to understand what's you know how how quote unquote they do things, then then I think you're off to a better start. And how are you uh, dealing with a lot of the criticisms that are coming up in American popular press about perhaps some uh, concessions or some um, uh, rolling back of certain values that Hollywood studios uh, have been asked to make in order to get to that dollar sign of making the films in and with China? What are your responses to those kinds of My criticism? main response is a big sigh, sometimes a cry. <laughs> I, I find it so unfortunate. And, and it's one beef I have with Western media about how China is portrayed because the focus is so much on what the government is doing and it kind of misses the point about what's happening for most of the people most of the time. And I almost feel like I just want this period to be over and we can get, because I've seen the the, the dips and the, the hills and valleys. I was very, very active in China in 80s, 89 hit, we know what happened there. And so for, for the next 10, 15 years, China again was persona non grata, but it climbed its way back up. And then we had, you know, the Beijing Olympics and the World Expo in Shanghai, and then, so, and then the booming, booming box office. And that period from late 2000s to, you know, to about three or four years ago, maybe five years ago, was a, a boom period. So I saw how things can recover. And of course, those of us who are very optimistic thought, okay, now we're really there. We're, we're, heading, <laughs> we're heading straight to the hills and we're, we're gonna make something, you know, it's really going now. We're, we, we're on a path and there's gonna be more and more exchange and we're, we're, we're getting to a place that we've always wanted to be. But of course, it turned out to not be that way. And I think it's for reasons that are on both sides of the continent uh, of the Pacific. So uh, it will, it, we, we know it will happen again. I talk to friends all the time who are either, who are very bicultural, bilingual, they don't know whether to go back, they might be Chinese citizens or American citizens, or they've lived there for long, whatever, every, every version of bicultural. And, and many of us are really, for myself, I, you know, I've had periods where I was very, very active in China, but I never lived there for long periods of time since the 80s. For others, it's it's not that way, and it's it's very uncomfortable, and it's forcing people to make very, very tough choices. I, I do hope things will improve come in the new year. Given that you, you have the longevity of seeing those shifts over the last couple of decades, do you feel that this time is different than, than previous uh, flare-ups, or is it just part of the regular sine wave of, of tensions and then more collaborative uh, relations. I, I feel like it's different for, for, for a lot of different reasons. Again, they, the leadership uh, 
perhaps on both sides, particularly here though, I would say also because uh, in some ways it's better, in some ways it's worse. There's no doubt that we are so connected still. And it was almost laughable, you know, when we heard that, that uh, President Trump is trying to take WeChat out of our lives or now even TikTok out of our lives because there's so much interconnection. So the good news is that we're already so connected. There is not, it's never gonna be as isolated as it once was. The bad news is that there is a climate that, you know, that is familiar where China is the bad guy. And we've seen it happen before and we'll probably see it happen again. Um, but there are issues related to tech and to you know, human rights and things that, that flare up that um, seem to be highly, highly sensitive now and highly divisive. And unfortunately, people on both sides of the political spectrum have, have more or less coalesced. And um, that is a bit unusual. I think that's a little bit unusual. I, I am very much hoping that things change very much. And it's been COVID has not helped because many of my friends have experienced anti-Asian racist uh, verbal or even sometimes physical attacks. So it all gets kind of lumped together in some people's minds. And that has been very, very difficult. Absolutely. It's most frightening when uh, geopolitical tensions are then translated down to the grassroots level. And I think that's a good opportunity to transition to Lucas because a lot of what you're doing with feeding the people is changing these perspectives of Chinese cuisine, of, of the, the images. Um, you had an interesting quote in a recent New York Times article where you talked about confluence, not influence in Chinese cuisine. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about that. Yeah, um, I am personally so excited to understand and um, study this type of, the type of Chinese cuisine that exists beyond the borders of China. Um, I've, I launched a dinner series uh, during COVID called Distance Dining, and it was a five course meal that was delivered to people in uh, New York. And every Friday uh, accompanying a sort of like chef's table style, sort of like Instagram live type of thing, you would get these meals that you could heat up at home that were prepared by um, myself and another chef. And the question we always asked ourselves was, what's the relationship between our cultures? So a really good one was uh, Chinese Korean food, for example. We're looking at the uh, cuisine that exists on the border. We did a dinner that was Chinese Indian food, where we looked at the relationship between Hakka cooking and West Bengali cooking, which is where the first Chinese immigrants went, uh, landed in, in India in the 18th century. Uh, we did a dinner that was Chinese Creole, comparing the relationship between the two biggest, uh, the two most voracious crawfish eaters of the world, um, people in Sichuan and people in um, uh, Louisiana. And all of these dinners just point to this odd, but seemingly unique uh, uh, characteristic of Chinese cuisine to be super, super sticky to wherever wherever the people are. So, so food ideas, recipes, techniques move with the people, right? Ingredients might change, but Chinese people throughout history have demonstrated a relentless ability to uh, open restaurants wherever the heck they are. Um, the first people to land in the, the first Chinese people to leave China and go to a place always open restaurants and they always um, evolve uh, and, and adapt. The, the menu always adapts to sort of like local palates. And in so doing, you, you realize that there's this sort of like global connection, this global Chinese diasporic cuisine that can't be confined by the uh, borders of China anymore. And there's a connection there, you know, as a chef, you can look at flavor profiles, you can connect Chinese Dominican fried rice with, with a Jamaican style fried rice, you can uh, connect Cantonese style fried chicken with uh, a, a Jamaican fried chicken, and, and you can like find these connections that are interesting to us as sort of like intellectually as chefs, but also as like consumers, you'd start to see this really wide, wonderful, colorful, connected world. Um, I used to believe that, um, I, I still try very much to believe that if you like a certain culture's food, it's a lot harder to dislike the people within that culture. Uh, perhaps COVID has disproved some of it. You know, Chinese food is the second most delivered cuisine, uh, the most, second most delivered food in the United States currently. Um, but people seem to have forgotten that around March and April. 
Um, but you know, dinners like this is that's our attempt to show people that um, Chinese food is worth thinking about. Brilliant, thank you. How have you navigated, and this is a question for all of you, um, we can't avoid talking about COVID and what is what connects everything that, that all of you do is it's about bringing people together for shared live experiences, for a baseball game, for a film, for a meal. And we simply cannot do this right now. So how have your organizations and institutions been adapting, not just to the COVID realities of separation and isolation, but this added layer of, in the US, anger and frustration at China for, um, for the blame game that's that's been part of this conversation. And Lucas, maybe we start with you because you've been delivering food. Yeah, um, our main, our first instinct uh, when COVID hit New York City was to start sending food to hospitals. Um, we have a number of Northern Chinese slash Chinese home cooking style restaurants that are um, so happy to be able to produce a large amount of food. Um, and we are very determined to do everything we can. We were very determined to do everything we could to um, keep our doors open so that our employees could continue to be paid. Um, so we set up programs with hospitals throughout New York to send them food in a way that was uh, that was COVID safe, that was uh, done in a procedure that was approved by a hospital. Uh, we wanted that food to be nutritious. Um, and one of, I remember once we were delivering food to a hospital in the Bronx and uh, these uh, black and brown sort of nurses were standing at the door waiting for our little Subaru to pull up with 200 meals or whatever it was. And uh, they, they were running towards the car and they were, we have been looking forward to eating lion's head meatballs uh, and firecracker chicken all week. And I was just, I had this moment of like, awe oh, because it, it took us so long um, to convince people that, you know, Chinese food is not just sweet and sour chicken. You know, there's like all these other types of regional home cooking. Um, and here we are in the middle of COVID and people who didn't grow up with this stuff, people who probably didn't know that Lion's Head Meatballs was made with, from pork from the first place, were excited to eat this stuff because it fueled their fight against COVID. Um, and they're like little sort of like um, stories of optimism like this that I think a lot of um, modern Chinese restaurants in New York have really, really sort of embodied. Um, the first people to jump to arms to start feeding our front line so happens uh, to be uh, Taiwanese chefs, uh, Chinese chefs, uh, Southern Chinese chefs, um, people who run old school mom and pop Chinese American restaurants, but as well as like new age, fancy um, Chinese restaurants. And everyone was very help, uh, very, very willing to, to do what they could. So that was sort of very promising to me. That's amazing. Frontline workers were, were the chefs from Chinese restaurants across yeah, the world. Yeah, so happens. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Janet, how in this time where you're not able to create films, and we have a kind of an add-on question for you uh, from one of our viewers. Uh, how can American cultural institutions best prepare themselves to carry on such exchanges in this hostile climate? Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, this is a more hostile climate now than it has been in recent years. What can we do to prepare ourselves? In answer to your first question, things are obviously very, very difficult for those of us in the entertainment and streaming production has not come to a complete halt, but has slowed down significantly and nobody quite knows when it's going to be back up. So I've just been spending this time doing a lot of development of projects, working with writers, with directors, getting scripts, getting decks you know, prepared. And I think that's what a lot of people are doing. I know people who are in production, it's very difficult. People have to be tested multiple times a day. And you know, how does a hair and makeup person work from, with a social distance or costume designer? So by nature, our work is extremely communal and extremely intimate in a way. We're always gathered in small places. Digital technology has allowed people to do things in a distant way. So you have a director in one room and a cinematographer in another, and they're all just looking at a screen like we are right now. Um, so it's possible, but it does take a lot of the fun out of it. What I would say is that there are a lot of organizations like the one sponsoring this one, uh, the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations, like others that I'm involved with, like the Asia Society. I co-founded an organization called Gold House. Uh, there's the Committee of 100. There's many organizations that are very specifically trying to, to keep U.S. and China relations close, tethered, you know, so things don't 
don't completely float away from, the countries don't float away from each other entirely. And I think cultural projects absolutely help. I, I use the example of, of Over the Moon, but there are many, many others that are that uh, that that can really can make a difference because if you have people fall in love with characters on a screen, then it changes your perception, and and that's why I continue to love doing what I'm doing because if it were not for that, I'm not sure how how I would try and accomplish that mission. I do feel like when you put people well, up until COVID, you put them in a dark room or if you put them in the comfort of their home in front of the TV screen, something happens on an unconscious level about their perceptions. And I, 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 I just can't overestimate the, the power that that has had and how that has prevailed. I, I, I can cite uh, a movie that to this day, people seem to talk about all the time about how healing it was, and that's the Joy Luck Club. I was made over 25 years ago and people are constantly telling me and others involved with the movie, oh my God, I healed my relationship with my mother or I'm this or whatever. And so they, they're, they're, there are some that stand the test of time. And, and yes, I, I feel that this is the only way. And fortunately, Hollywood in general, the, the TV buyers, the studios have not fallen into the, the same kind of anti-Chinese sentiment. Yes, they are sometimes accused, but people who say that are a little bit naive about what goes on all the time. There's always a, a level of censorship. There's censorship in China. They're just much more public about it. There's censorship here. There's economic censorship. You don't get the money for certain things or censorship in terms of we don't want that cast member, we want this, or censorship about so many different the content. So it's something that we're used to. You know, it's just, it's not as obvious and publicized as it hears you hear, but it's just the reality. We all work within certain restrictions and constraints. Nobody just says, do whatever you want and spend as much money as you want. So I I I'm less sympathetic That's to, to that. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was simply going to add that oh. the censorship in the US happens in different ways, often through more economic models of where money is allocated by the positions in power. And we actually had a lot of conversations about this with my previous company, Ping Pong Productions, when we toured Tim Robbins and the Actors Gang in China, and every post-performance discussion we did with the audience, there were often questions about censorship and, and how Hollywood works in the US. And Tim was very um, clear in much the same way that you just said is, okay, we don't necessarily have a vetting process for scripts by a government body. However, there are other bodies that make decisions about what gets fu funded and what doesn't. And there are far more than purely artistic considerations in going into those decisions, often political, often simply um, bottom line. So I think that the nuance, that and not or, there's no simplicity of censorship in China, no censorship in the US, absolutely not. But to have those conversations and to see that nuance, we need to be sitting in rooms like this and with people like yourself who know both sides. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely, um, thank you. So Raymond, over to you. Are are the re are the rehearsals? Are the practices coming? Are people hitting baseball bats socially distanced? Uh, a baseball pitch is pretty distanced. How are you guys handling COVID? Yeah, it's been it's been really challenging. Um, you know, seventy percent of our staff are uh, are international staff, um, which meaning they're not you know local Chinese, and so that's been the most challenging thing to continue player development but also manage your staff and keep them, you know, locked in on what they're supposed to be doing. So as far as the player development side, you know, we, it's, it's actually been a little bit of a blessing in disguise because, and nowadays, um, you know, baseball has really focused and turned over to the, you know, the, the analytics part of the game, you know, focusing on numbers, making decisions about uh, making decisions on what numbers tell you, you know, I was just recently in, uh, a spring training complex. And I mean, there's more analytic people than actual baseball coaches in the clubhouse, which is crazy to me, but, but that's just how the game's, you know, uh, kind of migrating over to. So, um, you know, we, we kind of need to do the same. I mean, we're major league baseball, you know, we need to, um, adapt as well. So that this has given us an opportunity to kind of dive in into the baseball analytic programs, um, and kind of teach using numbers when we can't actually, you know, be there in person. And it's, and it's actually, I think it's going to, like I said, it's going to be a blessing in the sky because once we get back uh, to China, 
um, we can kind of incorporate that a little bit or that that will be a, a smoother transition, you know, when we incorporate that into our daily uh, instruction. Now from, um, oh, I'm sorry. And to answer your question, yes, there are local staff that are currently there in China. They are, they are absolutely, you know, killing it. I mean, they are, um, you know, taking the bull by its horn. They've had more responsibilities and more leadership roles. Um, and they've really, really, um, you know, uh, continue to, to push the player development and help out all the players over there. And they've, they've continued to, you know, to practice every day, play games. Uh, they stopped now just because of the weather is starting to get a little colder. And so now we're focused more on um, other activities, other sports, uh, school, English activities, all that stuff. So um, as far as coaching development, while we've been uh, stuck at home, uh, we did this six month uh, guest speaker program uh, where uh, we got everybody on Zoom and brought in about three to four guest speakers a week uh, to talk uh, about various you know topics, whether um, you know we have athletic trainers, so we get we bring in athletic trainers, we bring in pitching coaches, we bring in former big league managers, uh, at, um, uh, uh, strength coaches, um, any, any, anybody that can make it uh, make an impact. Um, and it's a really cool experience for them because they get to hear and understand and make connections and really understand, you know, what we do over there in China and the challenges that we face and, um, you know, ways that they can help us out as well and ways that we can help them too, uh, in the future. So, um, so yeah, so we, it, it's been tough. It's been really tough because like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, when we get these, when we recruit these kids to our development centers, they come at the ages of 11 and 12, but they've only had about one to two years of baseball experience prior. And so, you know, especially with these 15, you know, 16 year old boys who, you know, these last couple of years are really important, you know, development for them and, and having that hands-on uh, being their everyday type approach type, you know, teaching is really, really super important. So I kind of, you know, we feel terrible, you know, uh, we feel terrible for everybody, but, you know, especially for that, for that group, you know, who's looking to take that next step. And, you know, we really wish that we can be there, but we're starting to get coaches back now. Um, you know, I'm still working on my uh, work visa renewal before I can get over there, but it's, we're, we're getting closer. So, yeah. Thank you. Shifting to questions uh, in the last 10, 15 minutes from our audience. And just a reminder to those of you tuned in, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So we welcome you to include your questions. Please do include your names and affiliations when you do that so we can give you a proper shout out. Um, a quick follow-up question, just maybe briefly, Raymond, we don't have to go into it, but one of uh, 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 Andy from Wake Forest wants to know if your mission of popularizing baseball is in any way a, a chance to compete with the efforts to popularize soccer in China. We know that there's been a huge push and with uh, the ultimate goal of hosting and then winning the men's World Cup soccer. How, how is baseball competing on that arena and popularizing another sport in China? Yeah, we're not quite there yet, but I mean, we are working hand in hand um, with the soccer association over there in China. And, you know, they, you know, we really, you know, kind of feed off them. I mean, they have had a lot of success over there, you know, with soccer, growing the game, popularizing the game, especially at the younger levels. And so a lot of the, um, a lot of the ways that they go about it, you know, we're kind of, you know, learning from them and, you know, they've had some success and, you know, and we, we haven't in the past, but we currently have had more success getting schools into, I'm sorry, getting baseball into um, elementary schools. And, um, and yes, I mean, the second part of that question, um, that is one of the goals for Major League Baseball, you know, um, um, although in 2008, they did have an exhibition game, I believe it was the Dodgers versus the Mariners in China. Um, they had their, it was like an opening, uh, opening day game in 2008. But I know that's one of their goals. Um, is to bring back, you know, Major League Baseball over there to have another, you know, exhibition game uh, over there to continue to bring fans and continue to, you know, attract people, you know, to the game. And so, yeah, so I guess you could say that, yeah, we are kind of following along the same lines or footsteps as, you know, as soccer is in China. Um, but it, it's difficult. It's difficult because, you know, we trying to grow a game, especially the game of baseball is so difficult, you know, especially in China. Um, you know, China, they, they have their national sports, you know, and, 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 and it's, it's really tough to, 
you know, say, Hey, Hey, you know, here's baseball. Let's kind of insert you right in the middle. Um, but we're making, we're making progress, you know, baby steps. And, um, it's really, it's, it really has grown and it has really become a lot more popular, especially with the youth uh, over the past few years. Encouraging. Uh, Evangelista uh, Barilski wants to know, how have you dealt with, or how would you recommend that people interested in cultural exchange deal with people with prejudice, xenophobic, or otherwise resistant worldviews? Just a small, easy question. Lucas, let's start with you, because I think you've had some positive reactions to food. Everybody likes a good meal. Yeah, you gotta, I guess you should start feeding them. <laughs> start with feeding them. I start with a good meal. It's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard for hate if you like the stuff that's in the middle of the table. Um, but um, I think, uh, well, well, that's easy answer um, to keep people's bellies full. Um, but it's also, I, I mean, I love food as a starting point, as a launch pad to a deeper conversation about history and, and culture. Um, a lot of people ask, me why I'm a chef. Um, the best answer I can come up with is that my parents had taught me since day one that if you eat three times a day, you might as well be a little bit more uh, thoughtful about it. You might ask yourself when you're eating, uh, where's this food from? Where are the ingredients from? Who made the food? Why did they make it this way? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Or then why do you like it? Why don't you like it? Um, and when you start sort of like obsessing about um, where certain ingredients come from, how they have been uh, used throughout time and in, uh, in different sort of parts of the world, then you find a lot more sort of like interesting stories. Um, and at the end of the day, the food is just the food. It really gets interesting when it starts connecting back to people. Um, when you find, uh, when you learn that General Tso, the, the turbulent history of General Tso's chicken, um, that somebody in Taiwan claims that they invented it, somebody in Hunan claims that they can, invented it, um, General So himself probably had nothing to do with the chicken in the first place and you know get these little cute little sort of anecdotes and history like that. And that's sort of what keeps people engaged. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, as obsessed as I am about a certain period of culinary history, you also have to reckon with the fact that it's not the most important thing in the world. That it's totally okay that it's interesting for 30 minutes and like that's about it. Um, and then you can move on to something else and that's how you start to build a sort of more interesting, diverse database um, of, of, of cultural histories and stuff. Um, and, and at the very least, that's how we approach pop-ups. That's why we do pop-ups, because if it's good, um, you'll never get to have it ever again. If it's bad, thank goodness, you'll never have, ever have to eat it again. Amazing. I think what's amazing about food is it's conversation starters. And a bit in response to the previous question and a lot of what we've talked about, the only way to address xenophobia or tensions is to start the converse, is to have the conversation. And in order to have it, you have to start it in a way that starts at a collaborative um, position. It doesn't start off with the yelling. And I think a shared meal uh, is a literal way to do it. And I think a film or a baseball game or a performance is perhaps a more figurative way to bring people together for that meal, to start the conversation in a way that you can disagree and, and still see what you have in common. So we want, we want you to feed everybody. Janet, from your perspective, and, and again, we, we, we skipped over the last question from Hong Mao's of China's cultural productions. How, how are you dealing both with the individuals, but also the institutions in, in this really tense way? What, what can we be doing and what can people who want to work in this sphere be doing? First of all, I disagree with Lucas. It is the most important thing in the world, or if not the most important, it's the most consistent and the most unifying Imagine where we would be if there was no Chinese food in America. I, I shudder to think. Anyway, it, 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 is, it brings people together so, so much. And I, I think what all we all do with, with sports, with food and with, with entertainment and culture, this, these are all touch points that are very, very powerful. And I, 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 you know, depending on who you are, one may be more important than the other. But we just have to prevail. We have to boldly, fearlessly know that times change. We have to transcend what the, 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 the trending thoughts may be in the moment. And we have to have faith and believe because there's so much good, to, you know, and we've seen, we've seen what has happened in the past. Yes, there's been rises and falls, but our countries and our cultures are inexorably connected now. There's no, <laughs> there's no way we can, we can bring apart. So yes, we have to bring along those people who are xenophobic. Um, but I, I always just believe in good work, 
whatever it is, it's just something you, you create something that people want to watch or eat or, or do. And that's it. But fundamentally, we have much more in common than we have differences. So we find those commonalities. And I think we, we start from there. Not talk about differences so much. Everyone, you know, we're living in a culture now where there's just a lot of finger pointing and labeling and cancel culture, really on both sides. And and I don't like it. Uh, I, I think we have so much in common. We haven't been really focused on that. We've been so focused on the differences. Absolutely. And so what do we do about that? Or more specifically, what are you doing about that in your upcoming projects? Well, almost every project I have has some component of underrepresented voices, a lot of projects with Asians, a lot with Chinese, um, but with with also other underrepresented voices. And so that's I have television projects and film projects and they're just waiting to burst on the scene in all different genres, because I think it's important, like with Over the Moon, I wanted to do a family movie because we have to educate our youth. And, and they are generally much less biased than, than um, adults are. You know, we formulate these opinions over time, but I, I like the idea of doing a family film and then maybe doing an action thriller that you wouldn't expect, you know, would, would change minds you know, I, I try not to be too heavy handed with the messaging because I think people get turned off, especially in the West, nobody likes to be lectured at, but just to engage people in great storytelling and hopefully through that change minds, change I, par paradigm shifts. You know, it's it's really like a, things happen that you're not really, you, you may have an opinion, a hard earned opinion, but then it dissolves if you see things that contradict it, even if you're not, realizing it. Absolutely. I think what you're talking about is, and you touched on it, the difference between art and propaganda. Propaganda tells you what to think, whereas art is about how you feel regardless of what you think. And it's at that emotional level that hearts and minds are transformed. You can think differently, but if you feel that connection of empathy, you're going to start to shift. And it, it is a chemical reaction. It's seeing, it's being emotionally moved by something. It's putting the food in your mouth that has a chemical reaction in your body so that you're then having a great time. You, you, you can't, you, you're sitting in the crowds of a baseball stadium cheering and the high and the endorphins there. If we, I think we're, we're, we're sort of a bunch of drug dealers sitting in this room in the, in the job of creating these chemical endorphins that are going to change hearts and minds to, to see the world different, to see other individuals differently. It really comes down to that. Um, we are at time. Uh, I want quickly one sentence. If you could have one advice for, this is, this is coming from uh, one of our colleagues at National Committee, one common sense recommendation you would make to leadership in either country or in both countries to improve our relationships working forward. You, you, you are the all powerful, you get one common sense recommendation what would you say? Raymond, go. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, gosh, just, I mean, I know this is so simple, but just play sports. You know, one thing that I was going to touch on, you know, real quick, I mean, sports is such a universal language. I mean, just in the World Series this year, I mean, you have a, a Latin American playing shortstop. You got a, you know, a Japanese, you know, a, you know, playing first base. And, you know, so many different cultures and so many different many backgrounds that don't even speak the same language, but they can find a way to come together and win a World Series, a World Series title, you know? And so just, just you know, get your kids involved in sports. I mean, sports is, is, is so impactful, teaches you so many different things about life, you know, especially baseball. It's such the, it, it, it's the sport that we always say, um, you know, it's the, it's a game of failure. You know, you, 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 you get three hits out of 10 tries and you're in the hall of fame. You know, I mean, what other sport can you say that, you know, let alone still have a job by, you know, only succeeding 30% of the time. I mean, in baseball, you know, you're in the hall of fame if you, yeah, if you, you know, succeed 30% of the time. And so just, just play the game, you know, and that's, that's, you know, baseball and other sports has made me who I am today. It's given me the opportunities that I am today. Um, it's just so, so impactful, so important. So, and for your to, to, um To paraphrase, I think the, uh, one, someone in the recent election said about the two political opponents, we, we are competitors, we're not enemies. And so I think the sports analogy is a great one. You can compete all out on the sports field, but when you come off, you have a beer and you're still friends, regardless of your disagreements. Exactly. Janet, one sentence. 
I want to incorporate all of this. I think we should eat more of each other's food, listen to each other's music, watch each other's movies, play each other's sports, all of it. Work and play together. Play, start with play. Start with play, start with leisure activities when everyone's relaxed. And I think it's a that's a great place to start. Here, here, joy, absolutely. Thank you. Lucas, the final word. I have nothing, I have nothing intelligent to add, only that. <laughs> I mean, in 1972, uh, Joe and Lai put Peking duck on the table because he knew it would end the Cold War. There are many, many things more interesting to eat than Peking duck now that we can put on the table. Um, so I suppose um, it would be interesting to see how pe leaders um, go out and find food that represents themselves, tells a story, and then shares them with people of other cultures. Gorgeous. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you for coming together. Thank you for feeding us with your uh, conversations today. Uh, we'll be sharing everybody's social media handles so our listeners can continue to follow every all of you, Lucas, Raymond, and Janet, so that we know what's next for all of you. And I believe I hand it back to Erica for closing remarks. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. I really wish we had more time to answer everybody's questions but we are unfortunately out of time. Um, thank you to everybody in the audience for joining the National Committee for our second night of the 2020 Chinatown Hall series. The committee thanks Allison, Lucas, Ray, Janet for their thoughtful remarks. And we hope that audience members who enjoyed this program will also register and join us for the rest of the CTH series. Um, we've posted the registration links in the chat box below for those who are interested, or you can go to our website at ncuser.org slash CTH and register there. Thank you all again for joining us and have a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. <laughs>